you can create vector data sets that allow you to get at something like population density through an image of the surface of the earth if you select the right tools to get to that you know final data set you know from from you know capturing an image of the earth to vectorizing a sample set to implementing that in a model and then doing the prediction on the larger data set of imagery that you're interested in Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. In just a minute, you're going to hear a conversation between myself and Stace Maples. And Stace Maples describes himself as being the geospatial Swiss army knife at Stanford University. He is an incredibly interesting guy and yeah, the, he's got this really interesting story how he got involved in geospatial. I won't give away too much right now. I think it's probably best if you contact him yourself if you're interested, but I would like to say that it involves body piercing and tattoos and it's it's well worth hearing if you've got the time. Just before we get into the conversation with Stace, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Mapsimize. So Mapsimize has been on the podcast before and they're doing something slightly different with, with Geospatial. So what they're doing is they're adding spatial functionality to a customer relationship management systems. So building spatial relationships between your customers, between your custom, your existing customers and your potential customers. And I, I think this is a really interesting use of the technology and I'm sure we're going to see more of this in the future. So there'll be a link in the show notes if you want to click through and learn more about Mapsimize. You're also more than welcome to go back to episode 67 and, and listen to Alistair Dickinson talk about his uh, journey through geospatial and how he ended up working or building Mapsimize and, and what it's doing if you want some more details. Okay, let's get on with the episode. Hey Stace, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for, for doing this with me. It's been a while since we talked last, but I'm hoping I can remember enough of the conversation that we can create a really interesting podcast episode for the listeners. So you are the geospatial manager and you describe yourself as the geospatial Swiss army knife at Stanford University. Perhaps before we dive into the conversation today around education and geospatial, perhaps you could give us just a little bit of, a, of your background and describe what a Swiss army knife of geospatial looks like and does. So I am the geospatial Swiss army knife at Stanford. And what that means is I support the use of geospatial technologies in research and teaching at Stanford, whatever that means at any given time. But it wasn't until uh, I was working on my undergraduate work in archaeology that I discovered geographic information systems and science and was introduced to those. My initial introduction was was actually after a particularly disastrous uh, senior thesis uh, where I was trying to do a logistic regression analysis on archaeological site location and environmental variables, things like distance to permanent water and elevation and slope and aspect and and things of that sort. And, and at the time, I didn't know anything about geographic information systems or making maps with computers. So everything I was doing was analog. I was using USDA soil maps and USGS topo maps and trying to blow those up and, and scale them on acetate to each other so that I could mark where sites were and record their, uh, you know, their various attributes for this uh, analysis. And 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 it was it was months uh, that I worked on this, and it was clear that I wasn't going to finish with the data collection at the time. This was in the mid '90s, and I had been I had begun doing some some computer graphics work, uh, playing around with computers and graphics. So I knew maybe there was a way to do this, and I discovered that the University of North Texas had a program, and I went up there and started digitizing my my data and. It took me three weekends to digitize all of my data after I'd been working for six months trying to do it in an analog method. method. And, and then once the data was, was digitized, the actual analysis on you know a, a slow computer of the mid-90s took about five minutes. And that was the moment that I was sold on using computers for managing and analyzing and capturing even archaeological data. And I was completely sold on this being the way not only that we should manage archaeological data, but the way we should be capturing. And so from that point, I started working on creating 
archaeological databases, uh, explicitly spatial archaeological databases for uh, geospatial data collection in the field, working on ways to capture data uh, with, uh, with kite cameras and balloon cameras from the air. Archaeologists are notoriously poor, and so everything that archaeologists do has to be done sort of on a shoestring budget. So you never have the budget for a flight, an aerial imagery flight, but you can afford a kite and a camera, the sort of stuff I started off with very early on. So you've got this incredible depth of knowledge. You've been in the industry for quite some time now, working with, with geospatial data, working with, with geospatial technology. And I just want to, before we carry on, say thank you very much for, for sharing some of your story with us. Much appreciated. What, what does it look like today? So now you're this uh, geospatial Swiss army knife, and we understand that you've had this, that this really sort of long and, and complex journey working with different technologies in different places. What, what does it look like today to be a geospatial manager at, at Stanford? What kind of technologies are you working with? What kinds of problems are you solving? It's interesting because, you know, I got started essentially in in academic GIS, GIS for research and teaching 25 years ago almost. And at the time, it was all about making the data. And really, the the geospatial world at that time was sort of, uh, especially in academia, was a was a uh, a one platform sort of uh, world, you know, everything was Esri, uh, which was, which was great at the time. It was, it was magical uh, to be able to do the things that you could do with spatial data. I was just completely blown away by the things I could do for archeology span with spatial data. But at the time uh, the problem was we didn't have the data, right? This was early on and, and there wasn't this massive push to create data you know fast forward 25 years and we're in a world where there's too much data um there's so much data that that we can't you know most of the data spatial data that we're producing right now will never be looked at will never be used because there's so much data all of the earth observing satellites that are creating publicly accessible data sets that anyone can go and leverage um, you know themselves are are producing these amounts of data that are, are just you know it's sort of harrowing to try to think about how to how to manage uh, um, the, these data sets and and come at them with questions but at the same time we've seen you know the rise of data centers and the rise of parallelized computing and and other methods of you know sort of of scaling our compute power and what that's produced is you know platforms like Google Earth Engine um, which is a freely available platform all you need is a a Gmail account to sign up for Google Earth Engine and you log in and you have access to petabytes of earth observing data going back decades, uh, you know, the Landsat catalog, the entire 40 year catalog available at your fingertips using JavaScript in a, in a, a little application that gives you immediate gratification, an application where you can take, you know, the Landsat imagery for the entire earth and stack it and create a false color infrared image in a browser within seconds. You know, the first time I saw that platform was in 2013 and it blew me away. I was used to spending hours and hours preparing, you know, even Landsat images, much less the high resolution imagery that Digital Globe and, and those platforms were creating at the time. Just processing that data, getting it ready to use. And, and now what we've got is all of that processing and, and management taken out of the way and people a, able to just immediately begin doing science with massive amounts of data that we've never had the the scale of access to that we have now. So what, what, can I just jump in here for a second? Because we, we've, we've come a long way. Like, and I think this is a really, really important insight that, you know, in the past, our problem was making data, right? And your insight here is, and I completely agree with it, is that we're almost overrun with data. And we, we've talked about this a couple of times before on the podcast. And I think this is why there's so much hype around machine learning and AI, because there's this recognition that there's so much out there that if we don't do something, it's, you know, we're just 
stockpiling it for for no particular reason because humans will never be able to sort through it but you, you mentioned before a tool like uh, google earth engine mm. and uh, i'm curious now do, do you think this is like is this the mic drop is this it like tools like google earth engine have they solved all of our problems oh no not at all in fact you know i i can't wait to see what what we're going to be talking about as the next big thing in 10 years. I mean, Google Earth Engine, don't get me wrong, is still face melting, you know, in its in its ability to move the 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 processing and and the things that are really hard about doing remote sensing out of the way and allow people just to get to the science. But, you know, I do think it's a mic drop, but we get these mic drops every 10 years, right? I mean, Google Maps was a mic drop. OpenStreetMap, and in particular, humanitarian OpenStreetMap platform and the and the tools that sit on top of that. That's a mic drop. Um, you know, those are kind of the kinds of platforms that have taken the idea of scale and laid it on top of 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 what was a really sort of fragmented and very localized kind of GIS world. When I came out of UT Dallas. You know, the GIS world was still primarily people coming out of college ready to go work for municipalities and state GIS and 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 work locally and and, you know, design things, uh, you know, within their environment. And and now you see uh, Google Maps in particular put everyone at the center of the map. And that suddenly opened up the idea of these opportunities for for the kinds of services that you could provide to people when they were at the center of the map, you know, without putting people at the center of the map, like Google Maps did services like Uber and Lyft and, and, you know, DoorDash and all of these, none of them would work. It's all about changing that map perspective from that high level sort of authoritative administrative functionality to that very personalized individual human centric sort of perspective that has allowed these kinds of services and companies to thrive. So it feels like in the past, perhaps ma mapping was being done to us, right? There was people in power in, in certain organizations, they were creating the maps. And now Google Maps, you know, and others, of course, have come along and put us at the center of the map. We are able to contribute to the map. When we think about OpenStreetMap, for example, we are at the center of things. Maps are now integrated into our lives and location services, are, you know, they're just sort of in the, in the mix. They're baked into what we do and, and how we navigate our world now. So you, so I'm really curious now because you, you work at Stanford. How do you how do you make the graduates understand this? How do you prepare them for this kind of future where we're having these continuous mic drops where you know massive changes are being rolled out and it's totally changing the landscape in, in terms of geospatial? Now, in terms of, of conveying this sort of fast-paced and fast-changing world of geospatial to, to students, um, you know, you just have to you just have to redesign things. My job really, you know, my, my job, uh, you know, explicitly is to support the, the use of geospatial technologies and research and teaching at Stanford. Um, but really my job is to have a very broad general knowledge of the, the spatial data science, uh, playing field and who the big, the big players are at any given time, uh, what the interesting and innovative technologies that are happening, uh, are and, and how those might be leveraged in research. And one of the things that's particularly, um, well, satisfying about my job is I sit in the library. So my center is part of the university library system. And I personally kind of think that's an, an ideal place for what I do and, and other types of support like what I do. So people supporting the use of R for statistics or people supporting Python for, you know, uh, programming and, and managing large data sets and so on. Having a service like that in the library allows that service to be departmentally agnostic. And what I mean by that is, you know, 
I'll have a meeting later on today with a researcher from the med school who I'm helping find nomadic pastoralists using daily imagery from planet.com so that she can build uh, um, randomized public health surveys for this population that's never been surveyed for their public health needs before. And then I'll also have a meeting with some folks who are working on the deep history of Rio de Janeiro, and we'll be getting their geocoders for the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century Rio de Janeiro up and running on an ArcGIS.com service so that their scholars all over the world can use those geocoders to take their historic data and geocode it to you know, the historic uh, addresses that they're interested in. And what all of that requires is that sort of broad knowledge of the infrastructure infrastructure that runs spatial data in general. Things like ArcGIS.com, PostGIS, um, Mapbox's infrastructure, uh, you know, things of that sort. Understanding the sort of the the grid work. I'm I, I guess probably a really accurate description of what I do is general contracting. I sort of know who all the subcontractors are. And so when a researcher comes to me and says, I need to find people in the middle of nowhere and I need to find them and get to them within a couple of weeks of, of, of finding those locations, those current locations, I have to know where that data comes from. If it's, if the resolution is going to be sufficient, how to manage that massive amount of data once it gets to me, how to process it to get it ready, how to create an application that allows several people in tandem to crowd sort of crowdsource the the survey of that imagery to locate the settlements and then get that data into a format that's usable for the statistician to build the public health survey. And so where I sit, I see a lot of mixing and things that I learn supporting, for instance, public health surveys for med school researchers are cross-pollinating research in areas like digital humanities or social sciences or even archaeology. It's a really interesting nexus. I get to see what everybody's doing and everybody comes at things a little differently and uses different parts of this this sort of universe of geospatial technology and i can help sort of take ideas from one place and test them out in other places and suggest oh you might take a look at what they're doing in this space in this application area because it's interesting and it might intersect with what you're trying to do so I, I realize that you're in a, a unique position here. You know, firstly, you're at, at this incredibly well-known university and you're in the library and your job is to understand how these tools work and how they can be best used to support the, these different subject areas, these different subject experts. Um, but I, oftentimes when we think about geospatial or talk about it as a science, as a job, as a career, we, we talk about the need for the subject knowledge, that it's geospatial in itself isn't enough. We need to know how to to apply it to a specific subject. Um, do you think that's a, like a, a good way of thinking about it? Because it feels like it can be applied to almost anything, right? So why should we limit ourselves? Well, I don't think we should limit ourselves. I think, uh, um, I think you're absolutely right. Everything is somewhere and that somewhere matters. It doesn't matter if you're doing medical research or if you're interested in car accidents or if you're interested in incidents of COVID. Um, those events, those things that you're interested in took place in a geographic location and that location matters. The things around that location influenced that event or the development of that thing that you're interested in. And so, you know, in the, in the forties and fifties, a lot of the geography departments in, in academia, sort of folded or, or, or drew back from academia. And what happened with geography is it sort of atomized and became this, this set of tools that other application areas began using to measure, analyze, manage their data in a way that was explicitly spatial. And, and so I do think that, I think everyone should learn spatial thinking. 
Now, I know from a previous conversation, you're in the middle of rewriting a, a geospatial course at the University of Stanford. Perhaps you could describe for us the changes that you're making to the course and, and why you're making it, just to give us an idea of, of how you're trying to, to shape the, the student's understanding of, of geospatial. And, and what's important for them? So uh, previously, this uh, this course was was taught in a very traditional way. Um, it's a very traditional fundamentals of geographic information science course that covers, you know, basic vector and raster analysis and some uh, uh, some very basic introduction to remote sensing. But it was ta- it's been taught in a very traditional manner from a from a you know a particularly common textbook that that most programs still use and what i wanted to do for stanford researchers in particular was was move away from that sort of very um very canned approach to spatial data very prescriptive very single platform focused essentially teaching people to do their research in in the Esri platform. Now there's nothing wrong with doing that. We use lots of Esri products to get our work done, but Esri is not the best way to do everything. You know, I mean, for one thing, you look around the Stanford campus and a lot of these students, 80% of the students are on Macs and well, that makes it problematic to put Esri software on their on their computer. So just practical considerations like that force you to broaden the sort of the landscape of solutions that you're teaching students about and, and exposing them to. So what I'm doing is I'm replacing that sort of single platform, uniform experience with something that's a little more akin to the kind of hackathons that we put on at Stanford annually. We have, uh, uh, I'm involved in the planning in two of the the hackathons that we do at, at Stanford. One's called the Tree Hacks Hackathon, and it's a gigantic hackathon that involves uh, last year, 1,600 students from all over the world coming together to work on problems that stakeholders had presented to them and pitched to them and work with mentors from companies like Google and Mapbox and Planet and so on. And then we also have a hackathon in the School of Earth every year that's focused on environmental applications. This last year, our big hackathon uh, was on wildfire. And those tend to take a more uh, sort of informal um, uh, uh, structure. And, and what we do is we bring mentors in from companies like Mapbox, the, the companies that are making the platforms that we are using to manage these massive amounts of spatial data, because it's still the case that, you know, we're dealing with commercial products for the most part uh, when, we're, when we're working with geospatial data, even though, you know, for instance, Google Earth Engine is freely available to anyone with a Gmail account. It is still being integrated now into the Google Cloud platform because they eventually do want to want to place monitor, uh, you know, metering on that and allow people to build businesses on it. But I'm I'm exposing students to this entire universe. You know, ten years ago there were just a few players in the game, and then suddenly after Google Maps and the mashups craze happened, you know, 15 years ago or so, you had companies like Mapbox and Cardo and and Cesium and Boundless and Planet and all of these other players that are now big players in the spatial data world, you know, as very small startups. And they were doing really exciting things. You know, I mentioned in 2013, the first time I saw Dave Tao from from Google Earth Engine uh, bring up all of North America's Landsat imagery and create a composite for an entire year. This, this, uh, this image, this pseudo image of all the best pixels from all the Landsat images for an entire year for all of North America in seconds, I was blown away and I knew it was a game changer. And then the same thing when I saw Cardo DB in its, in its earliest iteration and, and, and how it was this really powerful back end of post GIS with a beautiful rendering engine on top of it. And I thought, well, there's the vector version of Google Earth Engine, you know, here's how we're going to manage massive amounts of vector data in the same way that now we can manage massive amounts of raster data. And so I want to expose students to all of those things. And what I'm doing is I'm pulling out selectively sort of, you know, when we talk about projections and coordinate systems, 
you know, we'll probably bring someone in from Trimble to talk about surveying and and how projections and coordinate systems are critical to accurate surveying technologies. And and when we talk about remote sensing, we're going to bring the Google Earth Engine developers in, and they're going to talk about how they developed this platform and why they developed this platform in in particular to the students. And and that's I want them to to be exposed to the the bleeding edge technology so that they can make those critical decisions about what's the best tool for my particular problem. Because I don't believe that, you know, you should be a, a shop with just a hammer. Um, there are lots of shops that just have hammers. They have that Esri hammer, right? And and that Esri hammer is really useful and great. And it, and it will do nine out of the 10 things that you really need it to do. And it'll do them in a way that's pretty easy for people, even with without deep you know technical background uh to to uh to execute but it might not be the best way to do things right like if you're going to do field work and manage a hundred people in the field collecting data our our arcgis collector is the platform to do that with and in arcgis.com but if you're just helping you know a grad student go do personal research and they're one person who needs to map you know frogs in the rainforest then they might you know avenza pdf maps might be the best thing in the world for them because it's easy and they get pdf maps that they can print out for their coworkers and things like that and so i want them to know what the entire landscape looks like and so we're going to expose them to that entire landscape we'll move through everything we can from from creating spatial data with the humanitarian open street map platform uh, for active response projects that are being posted by uh, missing maps and medicine sans, uh, sans frontiers and and uh, the red cross to doing remote sensing in google earth engine to managing the extraction of features with a platform called um uh, it, well, it used to be called RoboSat. Now it's called RoboPink and it's independent. There's some weird stuff going on with its open sourceness. But it began as this Mapbox platform called RoboSat, which was this really beautiful command line tool for taking yourself from an open street map query all the way to a, a model trained to extract particular features that had been digitized in OpenStreetMap. So, um, so we're going to play with all of those tools. You know, we're not going to deep dive in. in nobody's going to come out of my course, my fundamentals of geographic information science course, um, an expert in Esri software. They'll understand what they can do with it, and they'll have used it and they'll be ready to decide whether it's appropriate for what they want to do in the future. Uh, but they'll also have been exposed to R, to the command line with GDAL. They'll be exposed to working with Python notebooks uh, to do machine learning work. Um, I want to expose them to all of the possible tools uh, that they can manage their research with. I am, I'm a huge fan of, of this idea of, of using the right tool for the job, not, not necessarily the only tool that we have or not being married to a particular tool set, but finding the right one for the job. But I, I'm, I'm thinking here, the, the pushback on this is probably, am I going to spend the rest of my life learning all these different tools, right? Because oftentimes there, there is a learning curve and I, I think people sometimes want to know like what am I going to get out of an, my investment here is this something I'm going to be able to use in the future what what would you say to people that said look I don't want to learn all of these tools I'm not sure if if I'm it's going to be a good return on my investment in terms of time spent what we'll be actually learning as we as we sort of investigate all of those tools what we'll be learning is spatial thinking as we're as we're using those tools and that's the more important thing to get out of uh, out of the course. We will be learning about the power of co-locating data sets in geographic space against one another to be able to analyze features and phenomena against one another in that geographic space. One of the most powerful things you can teach a social scientist is, is simply how to bring a set of their events into a geographic information system and a set of demographic data into that same system and simply trans 
transfer the data from from the demographics to their data set so that they can go back to R or Stata or SPSS or whatever it is they're interested in doing the actual analysis in. Um, but that idea of spatial thinking, of, of thinking in terms of proximity and, and, and overlap and, and containment and adjacency and all of these, these, these interesting um, ways of measuring geographic space and the relationship of features and phenomena to one another, that's the real thing that you're teaching with all of these tools. You're teaching folks that you can create vector data sets that allow you to get at something like population density through an image of the surface of the earth if you select the right tools to get to that you know final data set you know from from you know capturing an image of the earth to vectorizing a sample set to implementing that in a model and then doing the prediction on the larger data set of imagery that you're interested in um, just knowing that the opportunity is there is important and you're right you know you know not everyone is going to apply these tools specifically and and one thing that I learned pretty early on at Yale is that not everyone needs to apply these tools specifically. Some people just need to know that these tools exist. And I learned this with a faculty member. His name is Derlin Fish, and he uh, and he's a he's actually a very uh, famous professor from Yale who works on Lyme disease and other vector uh, diseases, vector borne diseases. And he began attending my workshops early on and I would see him, you know, and the, and the second or third time in the workshop, he would always sit in the back and he would never turn on the computer. And so the second time I think uh, he was in the class about halfway through the class, uh, we took a break and I asked him, I said, Derland, can I get you started? I'm sorry, I've lost you both of these times. And he said, oh no, I don't need to do this. I just need to know the vocabulary so I can talk to my research assistants about it. And that's when I realized that, okay, I need to build in not just the ability to use these tools, but the ability to understand and, and communicate about these kinds of tools uh, into all of the work that I'm doing, teaching people about these things. That was a really great moment for me uh, to learn that, you know, not everyone needs to actually sit down and use these tools some people are managing the folks who need to use these tools and it's incredibly important to make sure that those folks understand spatial thinking and the power of geographic data and and the tools that we use to manage and analyze that data and we, we see this all the time in, in it projects as well development projects where the the people managing the programmers they don't necessarily have to do the programming themselves but they need the vocabulary they need to understand what's possible and they need to be able to sort of transfer or or, or translate their knowledge from perhaps the the decision makers on one side and the people doing the work and sort of make you know so if things can align that way it's incredibly important and i think too another point that i felt like you were trying to make and please correct me if i'm wrong here is that i felt like one of the overarching overarching themes from the, your, your last uh, few statements there was perhaps it's not so necessary to be able to know the answer that we all know every answer but it's how to find the answer right and, and at least that's what, what what i got out of your your conversation there Absolutely. Learning how to learn is the most important thing. And in, and in fact, you know, somebody jokingly over the over the weekend, I was we were chatting on on Slack and uh, and and I asked them, you know, about about something and and they jokingly responded with let me Google that for you. And and I, I just for as a, a little side note, I, you know, I have a bit of a problem with that 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 phrase. And here's why. I've actually spent 15 or 20 years building the filter bubble that Google places onto every search that that I that I make in the Google platform, right? Google has built up this this sort of picture of what I'm interested in. And so my filter bubble on Google is particularly well tuned to geospatial data technologies machine learning on imagery, things of that sort, I can find things really, really quickly. And that is sort of the kind of thing you're going after. You don't necessarily want 
want someone to to know the name of every machine learning platform that can handle you know geospatial data and and earth imagery data um, efficiently you just want them to know that there are those platforms and to understand enough about the sort of infrastructure of geospatial data in 2020 that they can get to uh, what the the state of the art in you know for instance uh, creating spatial uh, um, data training data sets might be you know should they use label maker from dev seed or should they use uh, you know map boxes robosat and whatever format it is or should they use a platform like label box which which has some level of geospatial capabilities just the fact that they know for instance you know, you've got satellite imagery that's multispectral and you can vectorize it. You know, just those terms will be enough for them in the future to sort of explore the landscape at any point, I think. And that's and that's what we try to get across. You know, um, if you understand sort of at a fundamental level how things work in geospatial data and technology, then you can kind of anticipate if you're thinking about novel applications, what it is that you're trying to get towards. And that, that makes perfect sense to me. Stace, uh, I would just like to round off the conversation a little bit now. And I've got two questions I'd like to ask you. And the first one is, um, when you look at the geospatial landscape, when you look at the geospatial industry, what should we stop doing? Well, first of all, we should stop being mean to each other. I think there's really no sense in the compartmentalization, how do I say this? There's this sort of ex existential compartmentalization that I see in the geospatial data and technology world where you have the folks who, well, frankly, it, it kind of breaks down as Esri versus open source, doesn't it? And, and I don't think that's useful at all. I think, uh, uh, first of all, you know, Esri is a 50 year old geospatial data technology company. They know what they're doing and they do what they do very, very well. Um, and some of the things they do better than anyone else. And so taking an existential stance that you're just simply not going to ever consider using those tools is, is only is only going to hurt the projects and the, and the end results for, for yourself at the same time being you know, boxed into that Esri world, it limits your exposure to some of the most interesting and innovative work being done in geospatial at any given time. You know, machine learning on satellite imagery didn't start at Esri. It started with a bunch of, you know, techies working for other geospatial startup companies that were based on open store open source going and grabbing the open source software that folks in imagery recognition you know uh, working on finding cats and hamburgers and photos were using and tinkering with it until it worked for geospatial data and then releasing that to everybody and it caught on and people really started then focusing on that and the next thing you know there were there were five different platforms for managing geospatial uh, data um, for machine learning projects and they were all open source and and so and so I think you know neither one of those worlds should be mutually exclusive if you want to do really effective work if you want to see what's coming on the horizon and if you want to build lasting solutions you have to be open to using whatever, works best at any given time and also recognizing that these things and this is a really important point these things really have you know unless you're building sewer networks and things like that these things have five-year shelf lives you're thinking about five-year futures when you're talking about these technologies and that's and that's actually a long shelf life for some of these technologies these things turn over much quicker than that sometimes stace as a person who's had a, a long and interesting career so far and i'm sure it's going to be a lot longer yet in the geospatial world well what's the secret to to doing that what's the secret to surviving in the geospatial world having an inst and having a career that you're that you're proud of that you're happy with that you're still passionate about being obsessed with well I, i'll tell you actually honestly for me it's it's being able to work with brilliant students and faculty and staff who are always teaching me things 
the real secret is to be a lifetime learner. That's actually the most important thing probably in life is, is to, to always place yourself in an attitude of learning. There are folks that I work with who I love having meetings with because every time I walk out of a meeting with those folks, I've learned something. I've become more knowledgeable or smarter, or I can see things in a different way. And so that sort of obsession with learning and and knowing and developing, you know, your instrument, which is your knowledge of the tools and technologies and and application areas that that we do these things in. I do want to return to your question about what's one uh, one thing I would like to. I think there's another thing I would like to see, and that's specific to the imagery world. I would really love to see companies that are are beginning to image the surface of the earth apply the same sort of Bic lighter model that they're applying to the um, the creation and and deploying those satellites you know like the micro satellite uh, uh, model um, which makes everything nice and cheap and and build some robustness into the launch system and I would like to see them apply that same model to, their pricing because what you're what you see in imagery right now is an innovative model to deploy and capture and and analyze and distribute satellite imagery but a very dot gov and dot military based pricing scheme so that you're not really finding out what's the most innovative thing that be, can be done with your product I just want to elaborate on that just just for a second here, because earlier in the conversation you talked about the this um, filter bubble. So you go into Google and it's been watching you for the last X number of years, and it has a good idea of who you are and what you're interested in. So it shows you things that it thinks should exist within your filter bubble. And I, I think increasingly what we see when we see truly innovative things, you know, n- not particularly in the geospatial world, but you know, innovation. People just show up and they look at things in a different way. They approach the problem differently. And they're not sort of locked in to that filter bubble that you and I exist in, in in terms of geospatial. They're just looking at, here's a problem, how can I solve it? And that's where we see a lot of great innovation. So I I really hope that um, somebody in these bigger organizations is listening and takes that on board and helps people uh, give well, gives people access to some of this data and helps sort of drive this innovation. I think it'll be great for the industry and it'll be great for humanity in, in general. Yeah. One of the smartest things that Esri's done over the course of the last couple of decades is just pour resources on universities and K-12 education as well. From a business perspective, they're playing the long game, and it's a really smart long game. Right now, most people who come out of a university GIS program are Esri users. Other companies are being as smart about that. I mentioned Planet. They're being really smart about reaching out to research and education. Mapbox provides uh, resources uh, for research and education. Lots of these companies do. The The real bottleneck at this point right now is the incredibly useful, high cadence, high resolution earth observing data that is still primarily the domain of the of of the government and the military. Once you start opening that data up, uh, you're really going to see an explosion of applications that will end up building profit for those companies eventually you know they're they're going to discover the long tail that has made amazon so successful until you open up to that long tail uh you you don't know what's there you don't know what markets are there and what application areas are there so i hope sincerely that folks at you know maxar and and other companies that are producing the the high resolution data that that really uh is applicable in so many areas where we need good research um i hope that they will open that up uh more in the future Stace, I, I really want to thank you for your insights and for the conversation. And I, I think most of all, just for the passion you bring to the, the conversation of, about geospatial, it, it's really refreshing to, to talk to someone like you. 
Before I let you go, where, where can the listeners go if they want to reach out to you, if they want to find out more about your work or more about the, um, what's happening at Stanford University, or if, if they just want to continue this conversation? So you can find uh, the Stanford Geospatial Center on online at gis.stanford.edu. You can also follow me on uh, Twitter at Matt Ninja, M-A-P-N-I-N-J-A. Yeah, those are the probably the best ways to get in touch with me if you're interested in, in finding me directly. Look for... Over the course of the fall quarter, I will be releasing my my lectures for my GIS fundamentals class shortly after I deliver them in the class uh, as uh, as an open course. Um, so so watch for that. It's going to be something like a a sort of people's guide to geographic information sciences. Thanks again, Stace. I really appreciate it. It was great doing this. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, I, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with, with Stace. Like I said in the intro, he's an incredibly interesting guy. He's well worth talking to if you get the chance, and you are more than welcome to reach out to him online. I know that he would appreciate it. Big thank you to our sponsor, Mapsimize. They help make this podcast possible, and they're doing something really interesting with Geospatial. So these guys are adding spatial functionality to your customer management system. So this is the ability to you know, visualize your customers on the map to build relationships between existing customers and new potential customers. I think this is a really interesting idea. I'm sure we're gonna see more of this in the future. And if you wanna learn more about it, there'll be a link in the show notes so you can click through to Mapsimize and, and learn more. And that's it from me. Once again, my name is Daniel. It's been a pleasure being your host again this week. Um, I've been getting a lot of feedback through email lately and I love it. It really helps me uh, figure out which direction to take the podcast in, what uh, subjects you're interested in hearing more about, where I should focus my time and energy. And also, it's just really nice to know that there's somebody out there listening. So it's very much appreciated. If email is not your thing, you are more than welcome to reach out to me on social media. You can find Mapscaping pretty much on all of the channels. Uh, and you're also welcome to, to find me on, on LinkedIn. Happy to connect with you there. And if I can add value or help you out anyway, I'll be happy to do so. Okay, that's it from me. We'll talk again next week. Bye.